Welcome everyone um, to another session of PMF Connect. My name is Julia. I work as a head of product for Product Management Festival. Um, maybe you're used to already um, joining our sessions. Um, I'm just gonna shortly speak about what we are doing, what other initiatives we have, and then introduce our speaker today, Isabella. Um, there's a poll as well, please answer it. Uh, it's gonna be up for a few minutes. Um, and then we're gonna discuss a bit the answers. So um, just in terms of um, PMF, um, we do a lot of things. Um, we have uh, some meetups around the world. Right now, they're, most of them are happy, happening virtually, so you can join PM Nights around your area. If you're a product leader, you can join the um, executive circles we're doing. If there's not an executive circle um, in your area, we are always willing to uh, start a new one. So if you want to take the initiative and start this, um, just let us know. And um, we also do two conferences, one in Singapore, where Isabella was scheduled this year to speak. Uh, unfortunately, due to um, current events, we weren't able to do it, but uh, for sure we'll be back as soon as uh, that's possible. Otherwise, we are doing as well a conference in Zurich uh, in November. Um, we also collaborate with INSAD on an education program for product leaders or aspiring product leaders. It's a week of education which happens in, uh, on the INSAD campus in Paris. Uh, and we also have a um, trends and benchmarks report. Uh, we do a survey every year. Over 2,000 people answer the survey. There's 80 questions from psychological safety of product managers inside companies to opportunities for recruiting to salaries. So it's really useful. Um, the report is available for free to download. Um, if you take out your phone, there's a QR code you can scan and download this. Um, we are doing this to help the community. Uh, what we, um, what is really helpful for us to get back is uh, when we send out the survey to get some answers because the power is in the crowd. So together we can build it. Um, for those of you who are um, open to come and join Product Management Festival this year, we will do a um, reduced version of the conference in Zurich. Uh, there's a discount code available here. Um, Switzerland right now is a safe place. There's not uh, not a lot of uh, there aren't a lot of cases, so we will go further to try to organize uh, an event in person. And otherwise, for those of you who aren't um, available to travel, we're doing weekly these sessions for PMF Connect and uh, the other events. So we're trying to keep everybody happy and bring content and keep the um, connection between our speakers and um, you. And also you, if you want to share your stories, we're always available. Uh, we want to bring in more people and speak and I think um, everybody has in product a lot of good experience sharing and that being said um, I'm just gonna introduce uh, Isabella um, Isabella is currently working as a product manager at uh, Rakuten Viki she's based in Singapore um, today she will be speaking about for growth turn down for what uh, she uh, has worked in different companies from uh, IBM Watson to Deloitte to uh, Bumblebee Spaces a smart furniture uh, startup in San Francisco she holds a degree from uh, UC Berkeley and also an MBA from Wharton. And fun facts uh, about Isabella during the, the quarantine, she has uh, experimented a lot with Asian fusion and uh, took on juggling. Uh, but she said she will not uh, do a demonstration <laughs> today. So. Um, Isabella, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. And, uh, thank you. We, uh, your time here. Great, so I will I'll share my screen. Alrighty, can you guys see it? Yep. Okay, cool. So um, before I jump into the presentation, just a quick um, rules of engagement. Um, I would love to know 
the audience well. So if you want, um, do change your name to name dash company um, by changing it in the participant section. Um, also, feel free to drop your questions, suggestions anytime in the Zoom chat. Um, do use the hand emojis in the participant section liberally. Um, Yulia and I will be monitoring it. And we can get started. Are we good to start, Yulia? Um, yeah. 6.05? Okay, great. Great. So in the next hour or so, um, what's in it for you to stay? Um, I would be addressing some questions that is common. You know, why should we focus on monetization? Oh, if we focus on monetization, are we doing this in expense of growth, in expense of acquisition? Um, so we'll uh, deep dive into that. Monetization strategy at an early stage startup versus a mid-sized company that I'm at right now. Um, we, will look at, uh, we will look at it through um, my experience. I will also share some actionable examples for churn strategies. And of course, last but not least, since um, I work at Rathapan Vicky, we wrap uh, Korean drama. So I will be showing a lot of um, backgrounds from Korean drama. So please enjoy. Great. And um, once again, my background, I am a product manager of growth and monetization. What that means is I manage our acquisition and monetization features. Um, so that will include tech that is used for acquisition. And we do have video and display ads, our subscription, um, our payment methods as well uh, at Rock and Vicky. Previously, I was product marketing and chief of staff at Bumblebee Spaces. Um, that is a smart furniture startup that we will look into um, a couple of slides in. Um, also product management at IBM Watson, I was looking into deep learning platform, as well as a recovering consultant from Deloitte Consulting in San Francisco. All right, first things first, um, I want to lay out the most common monetization models for B2C companies. And of course, they're divided into two sections. One is where the customer pays directly, and then second, um, the third party payment uh, setting. So 50% of all apps do have one-time purchase, uh, flat pricing, um, like with Amazon, um, and bulk pricing is when you um, get bulk discounts uh, when purchasing in volume. And 35% and actually growing has some kind of subscription, um, and subscription is not all the same. Um, these are the different types. So you have all you can eat like Spotify, where you have uh, Spotify premium, uh, you get all the content within Spotify. Or it could be like credit, like ClassPass, where the subscription um, gives you access to a certain set, a certain number of credits per month. Um, or a free trial, actually almost everyone has this now, and Vicky also has a seven day free trial. Um, and of course, the razor and blade. So the razor is where you buy um, the hardware or, or uh, pay upfront, and then the blade is where you have a subscription model, um, such as like Peloton. And going to third party, we have 65% of monetization occurring through advertising, could be a direct sale, uh, could be programmatic through Google, and uh, reward ads itself. Um, affiliate marketing, this is like if you, if you are from the US, um, the point sky, we refer to um, credit card and then we get paid through that. Um, also data monetization, although this is getting harder and harder with the advent of GDPR and CCPA, um, but this is a very viable one if you have more than 50,000 um, daily active users. Um, B2B2C, and I do see a lot of people um, in the poll also has B2B2C model. Um, so very exciting. And I know some of you guys with the sharp eyes probably noticed that these do not add up to 100%. And they're not supposed to because many like Vicky, we have um, a combination of these monetization models. So at Vicky, we are both advertising supported as well as subscription supported. Um, and it helps us tap into both 
the price sensitive crowd as well as the power users. So I'm gonna share the end of the poll. Um, so looking at the poll results, I think they're not very representative of these B2C um, monetization models. Um, but we do see a number of you uh, uh, does monetize through subscription, which I will be talking um, a lot about, and also monetization through a transaction as well. Okay, so I'm gonna stop share. We stop sharing the poll results. Right. Okay. And jump into our first common question. Um, so in the beginning, I did mention that one of the most common questions is why, why should we focus on monetization um, in, you know, prior, and prioritize that against retention or um, acquisition? And that's because according to ProfitWell, um, and ProfitWell is a pricing intelligent and dashboard company, um, they found that focusing on monetization increasingly yielded about 2 to 4x the revenue impact than focusing on just retention or acquisition based growth. And increasingly so, um, if you see the dark green bar is um, 012 to, sorry, 08 to 012, and the light green bar is 013 to 016. Um, and, you know, when we say prioritizing monetization, it means putting effort and resources and money into looking into, you know, if we have the right pricing bundle, if we have the right SKU bundle, if we should increase price, if our business model should change, et cetera, et cetera. So um, at this time, I would like to launch into um, a quick question. So we can take the next two minutes or we'll regroup in 6.14 or 12.14 uh, for you guys in Europe. Um, and the question is, looking at this graph, why is there a decrease of impact, of revenue impact and acquisition-based growth from um, the period of 08 to 012 to the period of 013 to 016? Um, and we can use the group chat or the, um, the raise hand function as well. So um, I'm gonna come back in 614 to hear um, people's answers. For those of you who just joined, um, we have a question here looking into why is there a decrease in acquisition-based growth um, on revenue impact um, from you know, the period of 08 to 012 to or 013 to 016. Um, we'll regroup in a moment to kind of um, hear every, what everybody thinks. All right, um, 
think it's 615. So I did see an answer in the Zoom chat. Um, Ollie says more competition and also more less than 1% difference. Um, okay. Oh, the, the, the decrease is less than 1% difference. Got it. But more competition, yes, that is true. That is one of the reason. And then I do see from uh, Subpo, from Cloud Robin, um, user segment has become more matured, yes. And over the period of time and converting from premium to paid users, um, people are starting to pay money to find value. So um, also, so more sophisticated users, more competition from other B2C companies. Yep. Um, increases in retention. Um, so Sir Khan, if you want to um, unmute yourself, maybe just give me an idea on um, what do you mean by increasing retention um, that would decrease the impact of acquisition based growth? Yeah, hello. I think uh, there's a misunderstanding on, on my side, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, no problem. Um, and then Malini says integration costs related to acquisition. Um, can you explain that, Malini, a little bit? What kind of integration costs? Yeah, I was thinking kind of the, the company that's being acquired with the company that's acquiring them, there's costs to integrating both the businesses that might impact some of the, the revenue growth. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, so um, actually the acquisition is more about customer acquisition than, um, than company acquisition, but that's a good point too, because growth is also could be by buying, like acquiring other companies, which um, I don't think this is the, uh, I think for profit well, they did not um, take that into account, but I think that's, um, that's a very valid point as well. Okay, um, great, so at the interest of time, I think, um, more what was um, answered in the group chat. So more competition by other people, by other competitors and also more sophisticated users. So it means that we need more money to acquire them, right? So um, that, that is uh, indeed, you know, some of the answers. So B2C companies, there's a proliferation of discounts and promos and referral incentive for every single app. So there is, um, not only the customer gets more um, clever about it, they are also, you know, inundated with choices. So um, CAC really increased a lot. And also uh, think about B2C companies and also um, to some extent the direct to consumer companies. Um, they, the, the advertising occurs with tech giants like Google and Facebook and it, of course Instagram as well. So these are um, two companies that really uh, duopoly or monopolizes the that type of direct to consumer advertising. And recently, the cost has um, also increased. So that um, kind of gave rise to a decrease in acquisition um, based growth. So the a dollar put into acquisition may not give the same. Um, revenue impact as before. Great, so i um, going to move on um, into our first lesson. So our first lesson is planning monetization at a startup. So what you're looking at is Bumblebee Spaces. Bumblebee Spaces is a Series A smart furniture startup based out of San Francisco. They design, they make, and install the movable parts that you see um, in the screen GIF here. Um, so it is a smart company because you can control, you know, the retraction of these furnitures by an iPad or even by voice through um, Google Home or Amazon Echo. And the first question I have um, will also take maybe about two minutes. Now it's 619, uh, I guess 620, um, and we'll take about two minutes. Um, 
you know, let's, let's uh, get our creative juice flowing. So seeing that, what are some of the business models that you, that would be ideal for a smart furniture like this? Um, you know, get as creative as you want, as um, outrageous as we want. So I'm going to give people about two minutes. We'll regroup in 622. Great, it is now 6.22. Um, I will start looking into um, the answers. So again, the question is, uh, given the previous, let me go back, given the company, um, Bumblebee Spaces, that have the design, make and install these movable pods, um, you have you know, a closet at the back of the room, um, a storage system and also a bed. Um, what type of business model will be ideal for a furniture company like this? Great, so I'm going into the Zoom chat. Um, Maruti did say is razor and blade. Um, Maruti, if you can unmute yourself, kind of um, try to clarify a little bit, like what about raise, um, what what is the razor and what is the blade? Yeah. Uh, I was actually thinking on two lines. Uh, mm -hmm. One is that, that you know, the first time cost to do the installation and all of that. And then a subscription model for the maintenance uh, aspect. That's one line. The other thing that I was also thinking was, uh, can we have like a multi-level offering where the first offering is the basic offering uh, that is, you know, I pay upfront and I get the basic offering and any other add-ons like uh, you know probably a cupboard or probably a sofa or a side table or anything would be like an uh, add-on costing so it's like you know you have an add-on on that awesome so i was thinking on two lines basically yep makes sense makes sense um and then i also see oh so did you want to did you uh, is your answer about the same yeah yeah okay okay cool um so I see uh, Tony, so um, rental subscription model. So um, can you expand, uh, uh, expand upon that a little bit? Tony, did I lose you? He, he did, oh, no, he, he, did. Okay. he actually said okay, things, so uh, also premium pricing on customization colors, materials. Ah, true, true. Um, yeah, so Tony said set rental, so what I assume this is um, basically free installation and then um, pay by a rental model. Great, great. And then Ollie, I see direct 
to consumer, B2B to C with apartment developers, rent bases, yep, B2B uh -huh, with hotels. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, I mean, it is still a thing for staycation, I guess, for hotels. Um, Cosima, um, one time pay for the furnitures and then subscription. Okay, so this is the same as the, um, as uh, Maruti. Okay, great. Um, so you, I think you guys are very, very sharp. Um, so, so when I did join Bumblebee Spaces, um, they were starting, just starting to think about product packaging and pricing. And um, there are three things that I learned uh, from that experience. And the first thing is differentiating customer and user. Um, you know, uh, I think Ollie um, mentioned this and exactly right. So we look into um, different stakeholders and we have to think through, you know, the whole ecosystem, the real estate ecosystem, people who want to stay in urban spaces. Um, and you know, property developers are uh, people who want to build, you know, small. Uh, they they need to build apartments with smaller square footage, and increasingly so because of land and regulation restrictions. And they want to build more units, right? This is our the the B to B to C part. Um, and this modular retractable smart furnitures do help to make small spaces feel a little bit more spacious. Right, um, and at the same time, the renters, um, they're willing to pay more for a studio that has retractable furnitures uh, like this. Um, and of course, the homeowners, um, they are separate stakeholders altogether because they are both the customer and the user. And something that we also think about is um, a home is something that is so personal, right? It's, it's a safe haven. And especially now that a home is also a home office, a home is also a gym, a home is also a restaurant and a bar and et cetera. So um, we really look into the value proposition of each of um, these users or customers. Um, and then second thing I learned is also creating pricing bundle that really makes sense. And this is exactly the question um, that I asked. So we could, you know, sell it a la carte, okay? If you want a bed, we'll get you a bed. If you want a, a, a closet, we'll get you a closet. But what really makes sense, I think Maruti mentioned this, um, has like the basic bundle. So we did have a basic bundle of um, a bed with storage and also a closet. That would be the basic. And then on top, um, there are additional things um, that we can offer such as um, customization or, or additional. Um, I, I remember this one guy who was looking for a retractable like bar unit. So he will store all his alcohol and then you know, it will come down from um, the ceiling, which is you know pretty cool. Um, and of course, we we need to think about um, how to make this. Uh, how to make the financials work, right? Um, so we kind of borrow from from Apple, basically, uh, looking into warranty premium. And I think someone, um, oh, Mar I think Maruti and Ollie kind of mentioned that a little bit, where um, it's it's more of we pay upfront for the installation and also some of these um hardware, right? Because um, yeah, I forgot to mention this, but you know, hardware tech is a very different beast than software tech. Um, different math on the monetization, the timeline and development is very different, and iteration um, it is very different as well. But um, that's a whole lot of other conversation that we can talk about maybe at the end. Um, and of course, determining the price points. Um, so we have to get a little creative since, you know, not we don't have a lot of similar competition in the market. Um, we do have one that is called Ori Living, um, it, which is also like a smart furniture. Um, but at the same time, you know, two is, is, is not a good data, is not a good data set, right? And we also look at cost plus as well, but cost plus is a very rudimentary and short-sighted way of uh, determining pricing. So we're looking to value to customer, um, and it, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. 
uh, and we need to think about what exactly are we selling them? What exactly is the value here? Is it, can we peg it against, okay, how much do people pay uh, when remodeling for an extra room, for example? Um, do you know, how much do they rent for an extra exercise room, going to the gym um, and so on? Um, could we also, you know, borrow from how Tesla, uh, how Tesla kind of monetized. So a lot of people, you know, Tesla is a great car, but why people buy it is the cool factor. And can we monetize a cool factor? Can we monetize bragging rights in this case? Um, and that, that was also something that um, we think about while determining the price points. Um, and also, you know, similar to customer value, one thing I learned from um, Reforge program is also the Van Western job model. Um, I'm not going into, I'm not going to go into the methodology, but um, it's also one of the, uh, the pricing um, methods that people use. Cosima is proposing a leasing model. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the, the thing about leasing model is that we will, that well, the company will have to uh, bear the risk um, in the beginning. But yeah, I think um, it's something that uh, we thought of as well. Um, and it also depends if we are trying to lease to the hotel owners or the, the apartment owners versus the home owners themselves. So these are um, very different customers. Thanks for the question. Um, and I'm gonna round back um, to the very the the previous slides where we look into you know acquisition versus retention versus monetization um, on on you know why should we focus on monetization? So um, three things that we look at while doing the sensitivity analysis. Um, what if we increase one percent of acquiring additional developer, which is a proxy to acquisition? And then increasing price of the Bumblebee suite, the, you know, the, the basic suite that we have. Um, and that by, if we increase 1% of the developers to buy a second unit for us as a proxy to, um, as a proxy to retention. And so what we see is uh, it kind of confirms the pattern that was previously mentioned. Um, when we increase the price of our product, it increases by about 16 to 17% compared to um, our acquisition and um, retention base growth. So just um, kind of circle back to um, why focus on monetization. Great. So going into the second most common question as well, um, would focusing on monetization means sacrificing growth, sacrificing acquisition, sacrificing um, retention. So um, going into the second quiz, so Yulia, if you can launch the second poll. Um, so the quiz is who, uh, for Vicky, so Vicky is a um, OTT streaming service. Uh, we uh, show a lot of Asian content, Korean drama, Chinese uh, movies, and so on. And we have three different um, tiers. So the, the, uh, the first one is our free users that is advertising supported. So the user themselves, they don't pay anything, um, but they would watch the show with advertising included. Um, we have our standard service um, in the US where it's Wikipass standard. It's $4.99 with no ads and we can watch most of the content, but some of the content are still uh, not available. And, we have the highest tier, which is called Wikipass Plus, um, which is $9.99, and it's no ads, and you are able to watch all the premium content. So um, he's asking if the um, pricing for the subscription is a monthly one. Correct, is it's the, a monthly one, yes. Is the subscription per month? Per month. Great, I'm just gonna um, wait couple more seconds for people to answer the poll.
Okay, I think people have stopped answering. I'm going to end the poll right here and share the results. Great. Yes, so um, the majority of you guys got it right. Um, and it shouldn't come as a surprise really, right? Um, so people who have access to content um, are happiest, um, even so they, they see the value of um, subscribing for the highest tier. Yeah. So because of this, I want to challenge that thinking that monetization has to come in expense of um, growth and retention. So as I mentioned in the last slide that it is a false dichotomy. It's about, it's not about, you know, monetization or growth, but it's about um, a growth loop, right? How monetization fit into the growth loop. So for example, kind of um, uh, go with me here through the growth loop. On the right hand top corner, we have new user. You know, they come in because they are recommended by a friend to watch Drama X. And in this case, it is Descendants of the Sun, if you um, follow Korean drama. Uh, and you know, the user loves the show and they continue, to, they continue to explore and find new shows. They become an engaged user. So, um, but also they did find that, oh, there's some um, premium dramas that are locked behind the paywall. And, um, because they have been enjoying, they sign up for the Wikipass Plus for $9.99 and they unlock a lot of the episodes um, and other shows. So with additional variety of shows, engagement continues to increase. Um, and because of that, user stays on longer and it recommends you know, other shows to um, more new users and the growth kind of continues. So as you see here, um, monetization is really a um, part of the, uh, the growth loop and encourages engagement, encourages uh, retention, and um, increase the acquisition of new users onto your app as well. Okay. So the third lesson that I, um, that I learned is deciphering retention. Um, this is the other side of the growth from monetization is um, on the retention and um, engagement side. So when I join Vicky and when I look at our subscription um, retention rate, like I have no idea if that number is actually good or bad. So um, we went out kind of hunting for benchmarks. All right, so what I'm showing here is the stat from Google Play Store. Uh, it was shared in 2019, that was last year. And this is specific for non-gaming subscription services that is on Google Play. So I'm going to take a moment uh, for you guys to see where does your retention rate fall within this. Um, and of course, the caveat is depending on your industry. So whether you are a goal-oriented app, are you an entertainment app, are you a social media app, um, these numbers may skew up and down, right? So these numbers are like a, a high-level um, average. So how, how do we read this? Um, if you see the, the first row, the monthly, if you are on the top 75th percentile of all non-gaming apps on Google Play Store, your retention from first payment to second payment, which is you know, um, people paying for their first month versus the, um, to the second month, that would be 70%, right? 70% of people um, get retained for the second month. And the average is about uh, 59%. And similarly for annual, we do see an overall kind of lower numbers for retention. And this makes sense because annual have a, a, higher, a higher friction, um, if you will, than monthly. So the 75th percentile is seeing about 57% of um, first year to second year retention rate, 46% is uh, the average. So in the same Google Play survey data, they did show that the top reason for subscription cancellation, um, initially within the first few days of, uh, of, of uh, signing up is because of cost related um, reasons. So the pricing is too high, uh, you know, um, can't afford to pay and so on and so, on, so forth. 
But soon enough, um, the, the close second and the overwhelming reason why users stop subscribing is because of not enough usage or lack of sustained engagement. So at Vicky, what we look at is um, going up the retention, um, retention funnel, if you will. And what this means is that um, we have different types of retention. So not only a subscriber retention, but we need to look at, you know, before that uh, viewing retention, how many people actually come back to view a video um, and also visit retention, how many people come back um, to Viki app, to Viki web. Um, and and why, why do we do this is because unfortunately subscriber churn is a lagging indicator. And um, for, for you, you guys who are on um, the subscription model, you know that we will not see this until the user has actually um, churn out. So we went up the, the funnel and look at lapsed users, so users who have not watched any shows for a month. Um, and previously, before that, we also go up again, look at passerby users, so users who actually, uh, who came to visit Vicky but did not watch anything. Um, and we want to know why, why are these users um, coming into Vicky but did not uh, see any, uh, did not start a video play, did not watch any, um, any content at all. So we want to dive into these frictions on why users are not performing call actions. And for call action for Vicky, we look at um, one video play per week. Um, and what we look at is also um, forming a plan of attack to increase the retention rate. Um, and we see it from a three approach, right? So um, at Ricky, we look at voluntary versus involuntary churn. And of course, involuntary churn encompasses users that um, have payment failures. And, and what we did at Vicky, we look at, okay, these are the users um, who, uh, who did not pay, um, but they did not specifically you know, cancel their subscription. Um, we have features like grace and account hole uh, with notifications so that the users can come back in to correct their payment details. Um, we also work with the billing engine partners such as uh, our uh, iOS and um, Android to enable these real-time notification. Um, however, if the user, if we go to the second one, if the, use, uh, if the cancellation is user initiated, we look at a couple things. Um, of course, we'll look at the reason of cancellation that they give during the cancellation uh, process itself. Um, but we also borrow from customer analytics from our gaming, uh, a lot of the gaming app, right? We'll look at um, how many video plays, what is their watch time in the last two to three months. Um, in the gaming uh, app, they call it kind of active index, right? Um, how many days from registration till churn um, sort of all the customer behavior um, metrics to see uh, and, and to see the pattern and to be able to maybe predict the pattern. And, um, you know, fortunately in Vicky, sometimes goodbyes are not forever, right? We do see a lot of subscribers who subscribe and then cancel multiple times over the years. Um, and they remain a very active advertising supported users. So they, they still watch a lot of our shows. Um, and, and they, you know, it, in order to re-onboard these users, it will be very different from onboarding a brand new set of subscribers. So third, we also look at where these people discover Vicky. Do they come from Google search? Do they come from um, App Store? And uh, we segment these into different acquisition cohorts. So that's very simple example. Um, in 2018, we did see that uh, you know, a ton of signups um, come in and this is because of a, a shutdown by our competitor. And so a lot of these users are very loyal Korean drama users that tend to be very sticky, right? So if these people churn, you know that um, the, the, way to, uh, the way to reach out to them is by you know, premium content 
uh, by celebrities that we already know that they love, right? So we kind of highlight, oh, these are the um, upcoming shows by your favorite celebrities, for example. Um, acquisition cohort will be very different during this COVID period as well, right? People have very different intent of um, signing up for OTT services. Um, we also separate out, you know, users who are acquired through summer sale, for example. Um, and when these subscribers are acquired through a sale, um, we know that they are probably more price sensitive and they might respond well to financial incentive if we um, want to uh, pursue them back. Great. And with that, um, I know it's 6.45 right now. I'm gonna um, end with some takeaways. So, you know, in the beginning, we look at monetization planning um, from a setup, looking at, you know, value proposition across customer and users and different stakeholders, um, looking into pricing bundles, looking into price points, um, and then we go into um, why monetization is actually a tool for growth instead of a, uh, the opposite of growth. Um, and, and then we look at retention, um, going up the funnel from lagging to leading indicators. And um, last but not least, you know, going on the attack from defense to offense, looking into how um, we treat different cohorts of people uh, that churn and how to win them back. Um, so with that, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions. Thank you for um, all the participation. Um, and if you have any feedback or any additional question, uh, of course, I'm going to stay um, until uh, for another a uh, few minutes for questions. Um, but if you could uh, fill out the feedback form, that would be, um, that would be great. Um, Vicky is also hiring, if you know, if people looking for full stack engineering or product design role, um, feel free to reach out as well. Um, and okay, so now I would like to open it up for question. I see um, Subo, and Subo, did I? Um, pronounce your name correctly. So yeah, my, my, my name correctly. Super. Super? Okay, great. Um, you're a little, it's a little hard to hear you. There's a lot of interference. Hello? So, boy, I think better if you just uh, write uh, down um, your question. Like, uh, your mic is uh, not so clear. Yeah. But you Hello? Uh, am I yes. audible? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so, uh, so Isabella, the question that I had uh, is uh, around the pricing models that you shared for the survey. Over uh -huh. there, uh, you showed for three the more. Okay, yeah, yep. Uh, the three models of uh, freemium and then uh, you have a uh, certain content shown for a uh, middle uh, 4.99 and then uh, like full uh, access with the 9.99 so yeah. uh, my question is uh, why do you keep the like the middle layer so since you know that uh, either people are going to come uh, as for a premium or uh, uh, like they're going to have the most value for money if they go for the uh, full package so why is there mm -hmm. a middle uh, package yeah um the middle package is our, uh, we have most people actually subscribing through our middle package. And, and this is because, you know, um, a lot of our users are pretty young, uh, a lot of students, and a lot of them are price sensitive. So they see that, oh, okay, well, um, I am driven by a certain content. Uh, so I like to watch Descendants of the Sun and Descendants of the Sun are available on the middle um, subscription, right? So they will actually um, sign up for that middle subscription instead of signing up for the um, for the highest tier. So as they watch and discover more shows, um, you know they they might uh, upgrade to the highest tier. So we kind of see that um, as the middle ground where people want to watch without ads and you know watch with some content, but um, they're not willing to pay for the nine ninety nine per month, for example. 
Yeah, so that's that's um, the reason. And um, so well, I think a lot of our OTT services is also, we are not, uh, users will, uh, users tend to pay for multiple OTT services. And as you know, you know, um, recently there is Disney Plus, there is Hulu, there is Netflix and all, all these other companies. And so uh, when you have to pay money for different subscription, um, some users may be a little bit more price sensitive for one over the other. Okay, thank uh, you. So, yeah, yeah, that answers the question. Uh, one just quick follow up on that. Yeah. So uh, do you also try to uh, convert these uh, middle level users to be a full uh, subscription um, user? So how do you do that? So yeah. You, like, convert that? Yeah. So the, from the four ninety nine standard to um, the nine ninety nine uh, yes. subscription, right? Um, yeah. So a couple things. Um, the 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 biggest difference is the access to premium content. Um, so a lot of these OTT services, content is king, and so people want to spend money watching a premium show or an, or an exclusive show um, of a celebrity that they really like. So um, a lot of these shows are uh, behind the highest tier paywall, if you will. So users who discover, oh, okay, now we have Drama X that is on the $9.99 paywall, um, they will then upgrade it um, to, to watch that particular show. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Uh, okay, I see some question. Okay, uh, so Ali's question, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how these things apply to B2B. For example, how does Vicky Virtual Cycle play out for B2B when the purchaser is different from the end user? Yeah, so um, even for uh, the previous, for, for the startup, um, you know, the purchaser is, uh, is the property developers and the, um, the user is the renter itself. And so the, a lot of the virtual cycle is not only growth loop, but it's also, you know, um, uh, like paid marketing loop and, um, and also uh, could be habit loop. And it, it also works um, for some B2B. And why I say some B2B is because, uh, for example, um, if you take SurveyMonkey, for example, um, so we could, you know, for SurveyMonkey, there's different tiers as well, right? And um, for, for monetization, if you pay a certain, um, you know, if you pay for a subscription, there are certain features that get unlocked. Um, so those features will then drive even higher uh, uh, engagement for these users. So they, they, they see, um, for example, for enterprise, they have security, right? Uh, SurveyMonkey offers security features. And um, these features will then uh, increase the engagement and the use for existing users. And then they will, um, you know, let, if, if, the, if the company, you know, uh, the employers, they're not there forever. So when they go to a new company, you know, they will, um, they will also get SurveyMonkey for their um, customer surveys or um, analytics. So it, it kind of um, flows back into retention and engagement in that way, um, depending on the different tiers that um, you have. And of course, for B2B companies, for example, like um, I used to be an IBM, right? Um, a lot of the IBM sales cycles are very different from, um, you know, the, the survey monkey type of self-service B2B. Um, so that may not be, uh, may not be applicable. So a lot of these companies are by huge contracts instead of um, paying subscription. Does that kind of answer you, Ali? Great. Uh, how, so Kasima, um, how do you test pricing increase to avoid people to churn? Yeah, so this is actually a very, um, 
a very challenging one, um, Cosima. And it, it is hot, right? So what, uh, for those of you that um, don't work with iOS or Android, so every time you post a price increase, so let's say from $4.99 now we want to go up to $6.99, um, so the whole thing about subscription is users are automatically paying. But if you have a price increase, um, and rightfully so, Google and Apple will tell the users, hey, um, Vicky is uh, now $6.99 instead of $4.99 per month. Would you like to continue? And as you can imagine, um, there will be some users who, you know, oh, you know, this is too expensive for me, and then they churn out. Um, so yes, uh, price increases are pretty hard to test in this way. Um, one thing is with the consumer with the Ben Westendorf model, we can test pricing without actually increasing the price first. So what it does is um, we use a it's, it's, it's a survey tool to see you know how um, what is the right range of prices uh, users are willing to pay for. Uh, Vicky, for example, and you look into the different features that um, is offered within the um, uh, within the plan itself. Um, the other way we can test pricing is um, we have to uh, kind of proxy out different similar countries. So, for example, if you operate within um, France and Germany then you will need to increase um, the price for France and not increase the price for Germany. But you need to make sure that your users in France and, oh sorry, your customers in France and Germany have very similar behavioral models. Um, so that's the other way that uh, we can test out pricing. Cool. Um, I think we have time for one more. It's, um, one more question, if you like. So, because uh, some people were asking me in private, um, can we share the slides after the? Um... Yes. Okay. So, to everybody, yes, we can share the slides and the video. Um, I think there's a lot of great content people want to see again. Uh, so, uh, we'll we'll send out the newsletter, an email to everybody um, with the content. Great. Uh, okay, one last question from Daniel. How do you determine prices by customer value? So, yes, so um, if, let's see if I can go back to that. Um, uh, yes, so um, Ben Westendom is one of the, um, one of the pricing survey that you can um, have. And the other thing is um, looking into customer value. So in this case, looking into, you know, what else would users do to get the, um, the value of a Bumblebee suite? So for example, um, if you buy a Bumblebee suite so that you can have another room, right? Another room to exercise in, another room for entertainment, um, how much would it cost to remodel an extra room? So we use that as a, um, as a benchmark for pricing. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, oh, is there a, okay. yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically how we, um, how we create or, or uh, estimate the value to our customer. And this is because Bumblebee, it's, it's one of the first in the market, so it's very hard to compare it against, you know, other um, competitors, so to speak. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Cool. All righty. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you've been a very engaged um, audience. And if, uh, so I will share this um, with Yulia and then she can um, distribute it 
Thank you so much, Isabella. That was super, super interesting. And I think there's a lot of useful examples from all the companies you worked with. Uh, I mean, so um, diversity of different business models and different um, products which don't exist, and products which exist and have competitors. Um, thank you for sharing the secrets no uh, behind them and uh, taking the time to be with us today. Um, Please feel free, everybody, to um, send Isabella feedback. And um, if you want to reach out to her, I'm sure she's uh, still available for questions also after this uh, session. And um, otherwise, um, next week we won't have a PMF Connect, uh, but we will have a um, PMEP leadership session with um, Max Esquel from Amazon. Um, Max, Max used to work uh, for the military and then he transitioned to product. Uh, and he's um, speaking about all the similarities between these two, so I, I bet it will be very interesting. Um, otherwise, um, I wish you all a very successful week. And from my side, goodbye, Isabella. Thank you again. Thank you.